Hi, I'm Johnette Williams. Welcome to Women of Grace. Today's program is an up close and personal with Steve Weidenkopf, a church historian who teaches in the Graduate School of Theology at Christendom College. He's a prolific author who has given us numbers of books on church history, including one on the Crusades, and has also authored a study for adults seeking faith formation. Join us today as we find out more about Steve, his love of church history, his interest in the Crusades, and why knowing church history can help us hold on to hope as we make our way through this our day and time. Steve Weidenkopf is our guest today. He currently hails from Northern Virginia, is husband to his wife Casey, the father of six children, and the grandfather of one grandchild. He is a member of the Society for the Study of the Crusades and the Latin East, an international academic group dedicated to the field of crusading history, and is also a Knight of the Equestrian Order of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem. He's the author of this book, which we have available for you, along with some of his other books, right there at EW. WTN's religious catalog. The book, Light from Darkness. Nine times the Catholic Church was in turmoil and came out stronger than before. Let's meet Steve Weidenkopf. Steve, welcome to Women of Grace. It's good to have you with us today. Yeah, thank you, John, for having me on the show. Good to see you. Well, it's good to see you, too. So I want to know a little bit about your love of history. Is it just for church history, or does it, does it extend to all of history? Yeah, no, actually, it's it's most of all a history. Uh, you know, I I really began my love for history as a, as a young man, a young child, really, because my uh, my dad was in the Air Force when I was a kid, and so I really gravitated towards uh, learning about military history when I was a kid. My grandfather fought in the Second World War, so that also helped, uh, you know, further that love. And so I began really focusing on military history as a kid and as a young man, and then really fell in love with uh, with church history and medieval history when I took a series of courses at, uh, as an undergrad at Syracuse University on medieval and renaissance studies and that that opened my eyes to just how important the church was during those times of the middle ages and just how unique that period of, of western european history was and so i um, wanted to continue to study and learn more about the church and about uh, that time period in particular yeah and and you've made a career out of that i mean here you are you're uh, you know teaching in a graduate theology program there at christendom college specifically about church history and you've written so many many books that involve the history of the church and a particular time period that you really seem to enjoy is this whole time of the crusades the crusades are very misunderstood steve yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, from that, that time of my medieval studies really flowered this understanding and this this desire to tell people about the Crusades, because as you point out, they are one of the most missed, often most uh, mischaracterized, missed under, most misunderstood events in all of church history. And, uh, you know, and I think for Catholics in particular, they they were a uniquely Catholic event, right? Catholic warriors participated in these events. Uh, the popes initially started the crusading movement, Pope Blessed Urban in the second, back in the ten, at the eleventh, at the end of the eleventh century, and uh, and so I think Catholics are uniquely poised actually to understand why people went on crusade to answer that question and why they occurred in the first place, and I think it, that allows us to be able to to be really um, people who can help you know break free uh, or break uh, through some of the myths that the modern world believes about the crusades and about why people went on them. Yeah, and, and as you say, I mean you know it was really a Catholic undertaking, but it was not. Not an undertaking for naught. That there was a good reason that sparked this need for the Crusades and this desire. So put us into the context of the day and time. What was really going on then? Uh, you know, why was it necessary to uh, begin to establish this crusading uh, outreach that soon and now is is part of our history? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just briefly, you know, you had to, at the end of the 11th century, uh, you know, you had the this group of people known as the Seljuk Turks who come down from the Central Asian steppe into what is now modern day Turkey. Uh, and they begin to take over a certain you know territory of what was then the Eastern Roman Empire. We refer to them as the Byzantine Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, and they win a big battle in the year 1071 against the, the um, Eastern Roman uh, Imperial Army. And so a later emperor, Alexius Komnemnis, actually sends representatives 
relatives to the West, to the Pope, and wants to, uh, military aid from the West to be sent to help him fight the Turks and recover some of his lost territory. Uh, and then, you know, news begins to come out uh, into to Christendom, to Western Europe, about pilgrims that are being attacked by the Turks in what is the Holy Land. There's indigenous Christians and Jews that are being attacked and persecuted as well. And so news of that begins to filter back to Christendom, and that kind of begins to raise people's consciousness about what's happening on the other side of the world, if you will, at the time. Uh, and there was great, you know, uh, love for the Holy Land in Jerusalem in particular in the medieval period. Uh, just one example, in the 1060s, a very popular name for female children of French noble families was Jerusalem. Oh. So the French actually had such a great love, medieval French had such a great love for the Holy Land, they actually named their daughters after the Holy City. So there was a lot of interest in the city, a lot of uh, you know pilgrimage and things like that. So when news came out of all this attack and violence and persecution, it really raised people's attention and, and the desire to want to do something. And so Pope Blessed Urban II Second, at the end of the 11th century, begins this crusading movement and once uh, calls forth warriors to go to the Holy Land to liberate that territory from from the Seljuk Turks and to restore it to the Christian patrimony. Ah, you know, one particular group of knights that is often misunderstood as well and legend has grown up around them are the Knights Templar. Tell us a little bit about the Knights Templar. Yeah, so the Knights Templar uh, were one of a multitude of different groups known as military religious orders that grew up as a result of the success, actually, of the First Crusade. So, plus, you know, uh, the Pope, Pope Urban II marshals these troops to go to the Holy Land. They actually are successful in the summer of 1099 of liberating Jerusalem. Many of the warriors who are still alive go back home because it, they considered it to be a pilgrimage, what they were t participating in. Some stay. Um, but not enough stay to protect the land and territory that had been liberated. And so you have this unique intervention, really, in the life of the church where you have these military religious orders. These are religious orders that grew up uh, that took the, the men who joined these orders, took the evangelical councils, poverty, chastity, and obedience, um, but they were warriors. And they their primary mission was to protect pilgrims, Christian pilgrims in the areas that weren't under Christian control, and also to defend the areas that the Christians had liberated in, in the Holy Land. Um, and the Templars were one of them. They got their name from their barracks that were on the temple enclosure in the in the uh, city of Jerusalem, and they became known as the Templars over time. And But yeah, a lot of myths associated with them because they became very powerful, very wealthy. They established one of the first international banking um, uh, pro, you know, processes, if you will, where you could uh, go to a Templar house in, in Europe, in Christendom, and, and deposit some money uh, and say you were traveling to the Holy Land. You wouldn't want to take a whole lot of money with you because you would be at risk for being robbed. So you would deposit it in the Templar house there. They'd give you a deposit slip. You know, Steve, on his way to the Holy Land, deposited X numbers of pounds or marks of cologne. You could go to the Holy Land to a Templar house when you got to Jerusalem, and you could give them that deposit slip. They'd give you your money minus a surcharge and so the first atm fee if you will and so the templars really <laughs> developed this uh this you know international way of banking really uh that uh, would prove very successful prove very uh yeah, financially beneficial for them as well and that ultimately gets them into some political problems later on in their history uh, and ultimately in the 14th century they're suppressed but. yeah that's right they're suppressed but they've been vindicated haven't they hasn't there been Say some again. recent th hasn't there been some recent study or recent documents that have proven that they were exonerated from that which they had been accused of or is that is that not quite the whole story yeah, I think, well, actually, you know, in the 14th century when they were suppressed, uh, the Pope at the time, Clement V, he never, he never really passed judgment on either their guilt or their innocence. He just he kind of suppressed them for the good of the, the church. There was a lot of political squabbling, squabbling with the French king at the time, Philip II. And so in order to, to just, or Philip IV, rather, in order to kind of just, you know, make peace, he suppressed the order. Um, but yeah, definitely many of the things that they were charged with, especially by the French royal officials and and the French King Philip IV, uh, more than likely they were not, that was not true. Um, but at the time it was, it was kind of hard to dis discern the truth and so he just suppressed the order, but yeah. Well, one of our great saints uh, was a crusader, wanted to be, I don't know that he ever saw a battle though or what happened there, but I'm, t I'm talking of St. Francis of Assisi. 
Yeah, St. Francis you know, technically was not uh, – technically not a crusader because he never took the crusader vow. But he did go to the crusader camp in Egypt during what we call the Fifth Crusade. Uh, and it was while there uh, at that camp that he crosses the enemy lines, goes into the, the Muslim territory, is, is taken captive and, and asks to be brought before the sultan along with one of his his um, companions. And he preached the gospel. I mean, the stories are that he, he, he stayed there for several days preaching the gospel to the sultan al Kamil. In the hopes that he would convert uh, and that that would kind of bring an end to the crusading movement in a peaceful way because, uh, you know, the Muslims would, would convert to the faith. Um, Al Kamil was very generous to St. Francis, listened to him, sent him back to the crusader camp after a few days didn't actually convert, but did, as the story goes, apparently ask St. Francis to pray for him, that he would be uh, enlightened as to what was, was really true. Um, but he never ultimately converted. So St. Francis's mission there wasn't overly successful, um, but he definitely understood why the crusade was happening and thought that he could contribute to it in a spiritual way by trying to bring about the conversion of the sultan. Yeah, what a beautiful thing. And I think that throughout history, so many great saints found themselves in similar situations. Uh, you know, we talk about St. Catherine of Siena finding herself there pleading uh, with the Pope to come back to Rome. So many made these appeals for the benefit and the sake of Holy Mother Church and to find a peaceable solution to some of the, uh, you know, difficulties, political difficulties and struggles that were going on in their day and time. Yeah, absolutely, and it's it's uh, you know that that illustrates really I think for us this this belief or this notion that you know we're members of the body of Christ, we're members of the church, and so although we need to be concerned about our own spiritual life and our family and our community and our parish, we also have to be you know also concerned with the larger church and do what we can, whatever role God plays or calls us to play, to do our part to help further you know uh, his his church and to further his, the gospel throughout the world. Yeah, you know I, I like to think about the fact that uh, Pope Paul VI said that the church exists to evangelize, right? And uh, we are the church, right? We comprise the church. So that means that we exist to evangelize, and we're given the capacity to do that uh, through our baptism, and all of that is, is strengthened within us through our confirmation. Uh, so we all have to be on a certain mission. You know, St. Francis of Assisi was on a mission in his day and time that was pertinent to that day and time, but we have to be on mission too, and it's only through that Catholic witness, uh, you know, blooming, if you will, in the midst of, 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 of the uh, pool of ideas and, and uh, ideologies that uh, are current in our culture that we're going to find real change happening. Uh, so we, we, we can look at all of this historical data, but when we put it up alongside of our own lives, the question is, what am I to do with this? How am I to imitate this? Yeah, exactly. And I think that that's why it's important for us as Catholics, right, to know our history and, and to be rooted in it because it we can learn from those who've come before us, right? Mm -hmm. And and that, not that we should live in the past or that we need to somehow think that we need to reconstitute past centuries in our own day and age, right? Because that's that's not the the, the church is a, is, a, is a living organization, right? Our faith is a living faith. Our God is a living God, right? He's a God of the living, if you will, mm -hmm. um, is a better way to put it. And, and, you know, we have to utilize the skills and talents that he's given to us in our own day and age, as you point out, um, cognizant of what has come before us and learning, you know, the lessons from those who have come before us, the, the positive and the negative lessons, in order to evangelize our world where it is today. Uh, that's, that's the key. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we're going to go to a break, friends, and when we come back, more with our guest today, Steve Weidenkopf. He's the author of many books, as I've been telling you. I want you to get out to EWTN's Religious Catalog and take a look at the books that he has written that are there for you and available for you there. Light from Darkness uh, is his most recent book. We've been chatting a little bit about it, but not too much. We're going to get into a little bit more when he comes back. Nine times the Catholic Church was in turmoil and came out stronger than before. More to come after the break. Stay with us.
Welcome back, friends. We're visiting with our guest today, Steve Weidenkopf. He's the author of many books. Uh, some of them are available for you at EWTN's Religious Catalog. This is the book we're featuring in our program today, Light from Darkness. Nine times the Catholic Church was in turmoil and came out stronger than before. This is a great book. It helps you to understand church history, but what it does is it also breathes hope into you. It really does, because you see how it is that God does work all things to the good for those who are called according to his purposes. And after each of these major crises in the church, guess what happens? Renewal comes. So we're in for something good, let me just tell you. We're going to have a really good renewal when, when it comes. I think we're in the midst of it right now. And Steve, we were talking about the Crusades and your love of the Crusades, and you actually belong to this society, and I'm going to read it right from the bio out of your book. It's the, the Society for the Study of the Crusades and the Latin East, which is an international academic group dedicated to the field of crusading history. So what do you all talk about? Obviously the Crusades, but how does that develop? How does that work out in uh, this very auspicious and, and, and beautiful group that you belong to? Yes. Yeah. Thanks for asking about that. So the group is is uh, is full of academics and others who are interested in the Middle Ages and in the Crusades in particular. Um, we do a couple of different things. We we sponsor a conference, uh, an academic conference, where young scholars can come and present papers and others, not just young, but we give opportunity for younger scholars to do that as well. Uh, and there, we publish a journal once a year known as the Crusades. It's a journal. It's an academic journal for others who are interested to read academic papers on the subject. And so it's. Uh, um, it, it's it, one way to kind of think about the group is, is that we're trying to promote within medieval history this focus on crusading history as it's kind of a unique in its own subject, if you will. There's been a lot of research and focus on crusading history over the last generation, 40, 50 years. Uh, and so m a lot of that information and a lot of that research hasn't kind of filtered out to other areas of academia, hasn't even filtered out most specifically into the kind of popular imagination uh, and so an understanding. And so that's one of the, the missions of the organization, the society, is to is to help fellow academics who might not be focused on the Crusades to have a greater sense of the Crusades and be aware of the research that's being done, but also then to arm members and other academics to be able to take some of that research and apply it to a wider audience. Is, which is what I tried to do in, in a book you've mentioned was the, the Glory of the Crusades book I wrote a couple years ago for Catholic Answers, where I walk through and explain the Crusades and the Crusading movement, some of the modern myths associated with it, and try to present some of this great research uh, to a wider audience. Yeah, I do believe that that book is also available at EWTN's Religious Catalog, so we invite you to get out there and check it out, friends, if you have any interest in the Crusades at all. And it also helps to put it into the framework of, of you know, the historical reality that it is, as opposed to the myths that that seem to have grown up around it. And I think that that's always important. There's another period in history, um, Steve, where there's a lot of uh, confusion on, on what really took place and what it was really all about, and that has to do with the Inquisition. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the other major events of church history that has a, a lot of popular recognition. And what I, mean, what I mean by that is that people, when you mention the word crusades or inquisition, people have some familiarity with the word. And then they have this, uh, usually though, they have an association with the word of so the kind of the false image or false narrative or the myths that have been given to them about it. And, and usually in popular culture and media and television and film and whatnot. And so people with the crusade or the inquisition, right, they think of this kind of monolithic church that uh, tried to control all religious thought and tortured and killed millions of people in Europe because they believed differently from the church. And that's very far from true from what the Inquisition actually was. And, um, you know, it really grew up as a result of the heresy that erupted in the south of France, the Albigensian heresy, uh, where eventually you had this, this understanding of Heresy having, I think I lost you. Oh, no, you're still there. Um, heresy having to be investigated by uh, the church, right? Because up until the end of the 12th century, heresy was really seen as a secular problem uh, and was the concern of secular rulers. And these rulers were not obviously trained in theology. They didn't understand, you know, what is authentically Catholic doctrine and what is not. And so the church kind of stepped in there uh, as an act of charity on those who were accused of heresy to really investigate it properly and to ensure that if someone did believe false teachings and was um, influenced by heretical thought, that they could then be taught the truth and given opportunities to repent and recant and rejoin the faith, if you will. 
Yeah. In your book, uh, Light from Darkness, Nine Times the Catholic Church Was in Turmoil and Came Out Stronger Than Before, uh, you dedicate an entire section to the Albigensian heresy, and you talk about the Inquisition in that chapter. So uh, for more information on that, you can get the uh, copy of uh, Steve's book and read that and, and go into a little bit more depth there than we're able to present to you here in the television program. But this leads me to the notion that, you know, all of us are called by God to a particular day and time, and we are to be uh, an instrument of the Lord in that day and time, a conduit of His grace, always leading people to truth. And I think that throughout her history, this is what the church has been about. Has she done it perfectly? No. Do we do it perfectly? No. You make a statement in your book that I think is a really great one, and you say that the church is comprised of fallen people who are redeemed. <laughs> Why don't you explain that to us a little bit? Because it applies to each one of us. My hands in the air. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I, that's one of my favorite sayings. Really, is is that you know we're fallen yet redeemed creatures, right? Yes. So, all of us, including those who come in the in the church's past that we study, and and as we've pointed out, it's another reason to study the church's past, right? In our history, is it so that we can learn from those uh, fallen yet redeemed creatures that came before us, uh, what they did right, what they did wrong, how they acted, either you know, positively or negatively. Um, and what I mean by that is just that, right? That, that we were not perfect, as you point out, or the people who came before us were not perfect, even those who occupied the highest offices in the church, that, that you know, still sinners yet redeemed. And so uh, there are times when we choose virtue and choose, you know, to do good things in accordance with God's grace, and there are times when we don't. And that's the same as, as people who have come before us. And when we know their story and know their history, uh, that gives us a greater appreciation for them. And then and we can apply some of their, the, the lessons we've learned from them to ourselves. And, you know, because I think sometimes we, especially with saints even, it's applicable to saints, because I think sometimes we have this postcard image of saints, the, you know, the holy card image that they were always perfect and always great. And, and you know, they were just like us. They struggled with various things. They were, they had, temp they were tempted. They, there were their own little personal foibles or sins that they struggled with as well. Uh, but they persevered uh, with God's grace. And, and that's why, you know, they ultimately are recognized as saints. And, uh, and so we can take solace and hope from from their lives as well yeah you even mentioned in this book um, is it saint hippolytus am i pronouncing it right i've heard hippolytus yes. but hippolytus is i think is, yeah and here here he was he was an anti-pope who became a canonized saint that's you know, wild. <laughs> it is wild. Yeah, he's one of my favorite stories of all of church history. Is yeah, you know, at the in the third century, and he was a man who, like you said, he didn't like the policy the popes at the time were following in terms of the lapsi. You know, those who had given in during persecution in the Roman Empire and now wanted to be readmitted when persecution was over. He was a rigorist, someone who said they shouldn't be allowed to come in. The popes followed a path of moderation of allowing the lapsi to come back in after a period of penance, and he disagreed with that. So he had his his followers elect him pope, uh, and he became became his own pope, and he was an anti-pope for um, close to 20 years through several different uh, valid pontificates. But at the end of his life, he and, and the pope at the time, uh, Pope St. Pontian, they both were arrested, sent to the mines of Sardinia uh, during a persecution. And it was there on the, in the mines that he reconciled himself with the true pope, with, with Pontian, and was readmitted into communion by the pope. They both died uh, in the mines uh, in the persecution and were both recognized as martyrs, and, and their remains were brought back to Rome, and, and they're recognized as saints, and they, they share the same feast days, the feast day of St. Pontian and Hippolytus in, in August every year. So it's a beautiful story. It's a wonderful story, and I, and there's a lesson in that for all of us. You know, sometimes we think, oh my goodness, you know, God could never forgive me for this sin. God can forgive all sins, and he wants to do that. As a matter of fact, that is what he desires to do, is to pour out his love and mercy through the salvific action of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, so that we can receive it and be healed and set free through it all. Uh, and, and all of church history proves that to us over and over again and it must be sheer joy for you to be able to present this to students there at Christendom College. Oh, it is absolutely. I, you know, it's it's. I'm very passionate about the subject, about church history, and and the medieval period that we've talked about. And so, yeah, I love I love teaching and sharing it with my students, and and seeing their eyes kind of open when we talk about various topics and and events, and and uh, how their faith grows as a result of of knowing the story of our church. It's beautiful. Yeah, it really is, and it's lovely also because you have the opportunity not only to share about the history, but to encourage them to enter into the history of the moment that the church is presenting to each one of us. 
Yeah, exactly. Church history is, I mean, that's a great point. Church history, the purpose of it is not necessarily just to know our past, right? It's not just this purely intellectual academic exercise. It's it's a, an exercise in growing deeper in our love for Christ and his faith, or in the church, rather, and our own faith. And so uh, that's my hope, right? With Whatever I do with my books and with my teaching is to help people grow deeper in their love for Christ and the relationship with him in the church because they know uh, about our family history. Well, there's no question, Steve, that you are an evangelizer, and it's been a pleasure to have you on the program today. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and being our guest. We're going to have to get you back to talk about some of those other books. In the meantime, though, friends, I want you to get out to EWTN's religious catalog. That's EWTNRC.com, the home of Holy Reminders. Steve's book is available for you there. Light from Darkness is the main title of the book. I'm encouraging you to get a copy for yourself and all of your good friends, you know, because that's one way you can evangelize, right? By getting very good books into their hands that have the capacity to inspire them, encourage them, instruct them, and lead them more deeply into union with our Lord Jesus Christ. As always, it's been a pleasure being with you. We look forward to being with you again. Until then, pop on out there to our website, womenofgrace.com. God bless you. Bye-bye.